Hello, this is John Milburn for Laws 12065. This week is week five of Term 1 2020, and we're dealing with Topic 4. Thank you very much for your involvement so far in this unit, and I do hope that you're making good progress in relation to the first assessment piece. So today is a two-camera session, and of course we have the group session led by students again for week five on this coming Wednesday evening. Some of you might wonder why from time to time I have sessions which are led by the students. It might seem a little odd. But let me explain some of the philosophy and hopefully that will then give you some better understanding of why I do that. The university adopts what's called a flipped classroom model. Now it sounds a bit odd, but it's something that CQ University Law School specifically adopts. And a flipped classroom approach, as the name implies, means that the idea of the learning process for you is that it's proactive. It's flipped in the sense that teaching and learning activities occur both inside the formal classroom settings and, and outside. Um, part of my role is to ensure that you are independent legal thinkers and that you are working collaboratively. In order to do so, from time to time, I ask you to take the lead. The side advantage is that um, you will hopefully gain better contacts with each other that you can uh, foster during the course of your studies and even beyond that. So key to the flipped classroom model are a few basic things. The first is that you need to have good research skills. The second is that you need to adopt a particular form of legal logic and legal writing, which is then reflected in your, in, in legal thinking rather, which is then reflected in your legal writing. And the third is that you are very proactive and you're um, rather than responding to that which is being provided you are being very pro proactive in your approach. So again, sort of going back to what it was like for me in the 70s, it was entirely reactive in the sense that um, everything was provided in written form or oral lectures. And in many ways, the task was to return to the examiner that which was said or written in the material. I want you to go beyond that and adopt a very proactive approach. Um, you can use your imagination in law and having a flipped classroom model provides you with an opportunity to advance your intellectual approach to your studies, being proactive rather than reactive and come up with an idea of uh, using the resources that are available in a manner that makes sense to you. So, a key aspect of the flipped classroom model is that um, the teaching focuses on you having a meaningful learning and academic process rather than simply re re you know, repeating what you've heard or what you've read. So in that sense, my role is to more guide you and facilitate your learning rather than necessarily have you listen to everything I'm, say I'm saying and um, being very passive. So you need to be active learners and we do that, and I, I certainly try to do that within a supporting, um, a supportive way, in a safe environment and, and of course in a mutually respectful way. Now that then leads me to just a further brief discussion about assessment number one. It's a due on Easter Thursday by 11.45 p.m. Many of you may have either completed the task or nearly completed the task. For those of you that are struggling, um, please don't be too concerned. It's only worth 10% and it's really meant to be something that gets you started on your process of um, answering legal problems. I'm going to um, just cover a couple of things now. In terms of keeping up to date and uh, answering legal problems, I want to raise with you a program or a platform rather called Barnet Jade or Jade Barnett, um, either way. 
we had a query during the week, very good query from uh, Ivan, I think, as to what I meant by two weeks ago, something occurred. Now, when I write exams or when I write ass assessment pieces, my expectation is that as much as you can, the answer is up to date. Occasionally, I'll put in a note to say something occurred in you know, 2010 or 2015 or whatever it might be. But largely the question is meant to be something's happened yesterday or last week or two weeks ago as at the date of the due date for the assessment. Now I know some of you might think, well that's a bit odd because on the one hand you're saying be proactive in terms of your time management, don't things leave things to the very last moment and yet you're asking us to answer questions that are based on the law now. And, and I get that. Um, so I guess the risk is that if you submit your work a week early and a case from the High Court comes out during that next week, you may say, well, I've, I should have referred to that. Um, but don't be too concerned. If you, even if you send me an email saying, look, I wasn't aware of this case at the time, then, then I'll take that into account as I would even if you didn't send the email. So I need to be reasonable about that and not have everyone submit their work at literally the very last moment. Um, now, the other thing is that some of you might say, well, how would I know about new law that comes out a week or two weeks or three weeks before an assessment is due? Well, the, f the fact is that I might tell you about it. The other thing is that if you subscribe to resources that provide up-to-date materials, then you may know about this. And uh, one of the best ways of doing this is to subscribe to a service such as Jade that provides you with daily or weekly updates through subscription. Now, Jade is great because it's one of the services and there are a number of them that are free of charge and provide you with information. Now, I'm just gonna share the screen, show you the Jade website and um, for those of you that have worked with me in the past, you're probably aware of Jade because I've promoted it on a number of occasions, but you'll see there the landing page for Jade Barnett. So it's jade.io and um, top right hand corner, you'll see that there's an opportunity for you to register for free. And uh, it will provide you with updates in relation to legal matters as per your interest. So if you go through the registration process, you'll see that it provides you with opportunities to indicate whether you want to receive updates on everything, which I would not recommend, or updates from specific courts, or updates in relation to specific areas of practice or both. You can change these. So my thought is that as you're progressing through your studies, you should probably start with that which you need to deal with the units that you're dealing with at the time and perhaps build on that or change them as you progress through. But Jade Barnett, it's a great resource for keeping up to date and it's a great resource for um, research generally. It's got a very good um, methodology for um, showing you about case laws. So just to select one at random, you'll see on the top right hand side, that it incorporates Jade Case Trace, which is a citator service. It's excellent. And um, on the right hand side, I'm scanning down quickly, but on the right hand side, you'll see there's reference to citations and uh, there's links to the cases that are um, referred to in the commentary. And it's all laid out in a really simple way. At the bottom, you'll see that there's reference to the way in which the um, litigation progressed. It also refers to cases cited in the decision and cases that are cited by the decision. So of course, if you're referring to a High Court decision from some time ago, then um, the cases that cite the decision will of course progressively increase. But even though this is a recent case, you'll see that on the 2nd of April, 2020, this case in the High Court was already um, cited in a Victorian Supreme Court of appeal decision. So it's a way of keeping right up to date and I'd commend that to you. So 
I don't want to overload you with information, but I do want to empower you as well. And you can understand how much better you'll feel about providing a legal answer if in your response you can refer to something that was decided by the High Court, the Court of Appeal, whatever it might be, um, the week before the assessment was um, provided. So generally, if you're reading and answering one of my questions in an assessment piece or an exam, and I'm referring to something that occurred yesterday, the week before, two weeks before, that will be by reference to the due date or the case of, in the case of an invigilated examination on that day. All right, so thank you for that. Now, as part of the flipped classroom model, I am also keen to ensure that you're comfortable with the process of legal logic and legal reasoning. And that will then reflect in your legal writing. Now, of course, at its core, we have the IRAC methodology, issue, rule, application, conclusion. We have some variations, of course, to that, MIRAC, which is IRAC, but at the start, we refer to material facts. I particularly like that. Another variation is CIRAC, which is where we state the conclusion, then the issues, the rules, the application, and then we come back to the conclusion. So it's, um, it's particularly useful in um, oral submissions. If, you, if you're going to ask for something that might be surprising, unexpected, then it's probably good practice to announce that at the start so that the person hearing the case, the judge or the magistrate or whatever it might be, will say, okay, so you're going to ask for something that is unusual or maybe optimistic. Um, let's hear what you've got to say about it, but at least I know where you're going with this. And another ver version and probably my favorite overall is the CMIRAC method, which is where you state your conclusion, at least in brief, then you identify the material facts, and then you go through the IRAC process. But it's a matter for you. Um, what I would recommend is that you don't have those specific headings. You can, but you, you don't need to slavishly apply the methodology. It's more a case of um, adopting this legal logic as part of your writing. Now, when you're looking at a legal problem and you're deciding how to go about answering this and you, you're trying to work out whether a case is relevant to answering the problem or not, then the process of deducting reasoning is important. Now, you might remember from introduction to law days that when we talk about deductive reasoning, what you, you do is you start with stating a proposition and you then make a statement of fact. And from that, the third stage of deducting reasoning is for you to draw a logical legal conclusion. So to give an example, all dogs are mammals. This animal is a dog, therefore this animal is a mammal. So you can see how it's deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is similar, but it's, it's a predication or prediction rather based on experience. Reasoning by analogy suggests that where you have one thing, um, something else that has characteristics um, will be um, useful in terms of the analogy. So because a certain thing is like another thing, then reasoning by analogy suggests that one thing will have the characteristics of the other thing. But you do need to be careful when adopting reasoning by analogy because this can very easily become faulty reasoning. And you'll recall um, a commentary about reverse accident and hasty generalization. And so to contrast all of those to faulty reasoning, where you will get marked down if you adopt faulty reasoning approach, faulty reasoning is characterized generally by sweeping generalization. So if the main premise is overstated, then the conclusions drawn from it will be invalid. Faulty reasoning is also exhibited through hasty generalization. For example, if you don't have enough evidence and that's contrasted to inductive reasoning where it does look very similar. 
And finally, another example of faulty reasoning is irrational correlation and causation. I'll give you an example. So during the last 100 years, we've seen less pirates and more global warming. Therefore, global warming is caused by a reduction in the number of pirates, courtesy of the new lawyer. So um, whilst you don't specifically refer to or cite the type of reasoning that you're adopting when you're advancing a legal argument, it is something to be mindful of and understand that this is now part of the process that you're adopting as you're thinking like a lawyer and you're writing like a lawyer. These are the sorts of tools that you use. So adopting good research skills, having access to online materials that provide you with up-to-date resources and writing in a way that incorporates this general legal reasoning is what we're trying to foster as part of the flipped classroom approach. And of course, very importantly in the flipped classroom approach is that from time to time, I give you the lead and I step back and I'm there in a more supportive rather than um, a leader, a direct leadership role. I hope all that makes sense. Anyway, good luck for your flipped classroom approach in week five. Now in week five, we're dealing with topic number four. And if you look at the study guide, topic number four, which deals with the issue of title to personal property, requires you to identify, appreciate, and understand a few things. So what we're looking to do is identify the legal features of how title to goods can be established. So how do you establish your good legal title to the ownership of goods, goods and chattels? In doing that, we need to appreciate the legal maxim, nemo dat quod non habet, or the nemo dat rule, as we often say. We need to identify the legal characteristics of conduct that might disentitle an owner of goods to their ownership rights. So as an owner, your entitlement to own those goods is not absolute. You can undertake some task or you can involve yourself in some conduct that will disentitle you to that ownership. We need to consider some of the statutory provisions. From a Queensland perspective, they're pretty old. We've got the Factors Act from 1892, and we have the Sale of Goods Act from 1896. We then need to consider how the law deals with sales and avoidable titles, and consider how property law regulates money and virtual property. So there's some of the basic aims of this topic we're in week five. And when we talk about personal property, of course, the basic distinction is between it and real property. So personal property is that which is not real property. And I guess that makes sense. Another way of describing personal property is to refer to it as goods and chattels. Very old fashioned terminology because we really don't talk too much about chattels. And when we, we do, um, but it's, it's pretty old fashioned. And yet it goes back to at least the 19th century and before. And oddly, even though we refer to chattels in the context of sale of goods, chattels is not defined in the Sale of Goods Act, nor is it defined in the much more current Personal Property Securities Act 2009, which is Commonwealth. So if we want to understand what a chattel is, we need to go a little further. One of the go-to sources for me is the Australian Law Dictionary, which is Oxford, and it defines chattel as a thing that is capable of being owned as a form of personal property. So it's chattel is a subset of personal property. A chattel can be real, it can be intangible, um, but ultimately it can be even a right to use real property. For example, technically a lease of a commercial uh, or, or uh, of a lease of commercial or residential property is a chattel. Um, the right is a chattel, 
not the lease or the piece of paper creating or evidencing the right. That's, I need to be very careful about that statement because it's really quite misleading in the sense that whilst that's technically correct, the fact is that we do regard commercial leases in particular as real estate in that a commercial lease which has a duration of three years or more must be registered on the title, therefore it forms part of the record of Torrens title, therefore it does gain the benefit of indefeasibility. So for all intents and purposes, commercial leases in particular are something that you might regard in reality as real property, even though that's technically not correct. So when we talk about chattels, we're mostly talking about personal property, mostly talking about goods. Um, but of course, there are some other ways to distinguish chattels. So chattels might be property that is available to be owned, for example, and it's personal property. But it might be corporeal, as in it might be movable or tangible. It might be something that you can physically touch, um, or it can be intangible, for example, a, a chosen action. So this is old fashioned terminology, but we, we talk about that which you can touch, which is corporeal as a chosen possession. For example, it might be livestock, livestock or a chair or something that's in physically in possession, or it might be incorporeal, which is or intangible, which is more of a, a right. So shares, for example, or a right of action, which is called a chosen action, um, or copyright, or a debt, or shares in a company are more incorporeal because you can't actually touch them. You can touch evidence of them, you can touch a share certificate, but it's really the right that goes with that entitlement, that property, which is the important property. So in a way, it's difficult to describe and to, to define, and maybe that's why they're actually not defined in the uh, legislation. Now, that's chattels. Goods is slightly different. Goods we typically think about as something that has a physical element to it. So personal chattels that can be traded in a marketplace. Have a look at the Sale of Goods Act 1896. Have a look at section three and you'll see that goods are defined as all chattels personal other than things in action and money and also um, things that are attached to or forming part of land that are agreed to be severed before the sale or under a contract of sale. So that definition deals with a few issues, but the basic rule is that if it's a good, it's a chattel other than a chattel in action or money. So money is an odd one, but we'll come back to that. It does refer to land, um, meaning something that is attached to or forming the, the land, which is agreed to or is severed before a sale or under a contract of sale. So what that means is that those things that might otherwise be chattels can become part of the land in certain circumstances, either by reference to a contract or um, this notion of being severed, which brings into play issues around fixtures versus fittings and brings into mind issues around the degree of annexation test and the purpose of annexation test. Now, when it comes to goods, we'll often contrast that to land or real estate. If we look at the Personal Property Securities Act, section 10 defines land as including all the states and interest in land with a freehold, leasehold or chattel but does not include fixtures. So again, that, that's troublesome in a way because I've just mentioned leases um, as chattels. Here, the PPSA is saying that leasehold interests are land and does not include fixtures. Whereas some of the case law says, well, if it's a fixture, it forms part of the land. <clears throat> so the difficulty is that we don't necessarily have 
clear cut one definition that meets all situations. So you need to work with that degree of um, uncertainty. But think of it as an advantage. Think of it in this way, that where there is some degree of ambiguity or inconsistency, it means that when you're arguing a particular case, you've got more to choose from. And um, you don't have to necessarily get the, the answer right in terms of a legal problem, but you need to identify different arguments. So a degree of ambiguity makes your task in answering legal questions easier rather than harder. Well, let's look at it that way anyway. So I've mentioned chose in action or choses in action. So choses in action were traditionally um, classified according to whether they arose from rights and obligations in personam or rights and obligations in rem. So the basic distinction, per personam, chattels, personal items, rem, um, which deals with uh, issues against the, the entire world. Personam rather is against, against a, an individual and rem is against the entire world. And the chosen actions can either be equitable or they can be legal. So if, for example, you have uh, something which is an entitlement in equity, it's an equitable interest. If it's a black letter law entitlement, it's a legal interest. And this is a throwback to the law prior to the fusion of law and equity. And um, it technically means that the holder of a chosen action has an entitlement in a court of equity or an entitlement in a court of law. But these days there's very little practical difference. So equitable choses in action include interests in partnership or trust funds or an interest under a will, whereas legal choses in action include debt, shares in a company or benefits of in a contract or copyright or securities. So there is this historical distinction between chosen actions that are equitable or those that are legal. And I've given you some examples there but in reality, don't worry too much about that. Um, I mean, I could set you a legal, I could set you an assessment question, you know, explain the difference in the historical development, but it's not gonna help you too much in practice is my view. But the reason I'm mentioning it is that you will see a reference sometimes to chosen action as being equitable or legal. Don't worry too much about it, but have a basic understanding of how that developed and have, an, um, have a basic list of, of both, as I've just described it to you now. And chosen action can either be existing now or it can be something that entitles you in the future. So when we talk about these chosen action, which are these intangible property rights, they can be assigned. And an assignment is an immediate transfer of this chosen action and it can be vested or it can be contingent but it can be from one person to another. Now generally they weren't transferable at common law um, but provision is made for the absolute assignment of, of debts and other legal choses in action provided the assignment is in writing and express notice to the person liable has been given. I'm going to share with you now section 199 and 200 of the Property Law Act. So now on your screen, you should see section 199 that deals with the statutory assignment of things in action. And it refers to an absolute assignment by writing of a debt or other legal thing in action of express notice in writing that's been given to the other party and you'll see there that it's a reference to the legal rights as opposed to the equitable rights that someone might have in a thing in action or a chosen action, which is, as we now know, part of our personal property. If we go to the next section, 200, you'll see that we now deal with the equitable um, side of things and the um, way in which the equity of voluntary assignments can be undertaken through reference to equity. This is not the easiest part of our law. 
um, the Property Law Act is not my favourite piece of legislation. But do be aware of the historical developments. Do be aware of the ability to assign those chattels which are legal and which are equitable and refer to sections 199 and 200 of the Property Law Act. There's been this distinction between that which is corporeal and that which is incorporeal. So incorporeal property includes that intangible things like goodwill, uh, which is in the context of a business, or actions to protect rights in a name. It's um, enforceable through common law passing off or by statute or by um, misleading and deceptive conduct provisions of the Australian consumer law. So some things can be protected from disclosure um, as confidential information. That's a, a different area of practice. We deal with that in equity, but um, you will come across that and be aware of it. So I mentioned earlier this distinction between the corporeal that you can feel and touch, the incorporeal, which is, which is not um, physical. Cash is different. Cash is unusual, isn't it? Because cash is probably more incorporeal in that it's more the entitlement that it gives you rather than the, the thing itself. But of course, you can't exercise the entitlement unless you have the thing. So cash is both uh, something that is corporeal and incorporeal at the same time in many ways. All right, now the NEMO DAT rule, um, the basic principle is that a person can obtain no better title than the transferor had to that property. The case that you want to look at there is Farquharson Brothers and King and & Co, 1902, appeal cases 325. And that case says that the right of a true owner is not prejudiced or affected by his carelessness in losing the chattel, however gross it may have been. Accordingly, carelessness in the case of a business, like um, in that case, does not prevent that person from recovering the property, which may have been stolen, for example. So that's the basic rule, the Nemo debt rule, but it is affected by subsequent cases and it's affected by legislation. I mentioned earlier the Factors Act, 1892 Queensland. Um, when we talk about the Factors Act, we're really talking about mercantile agents. So what is a mercantile agent? Well, a mercantile agent is, for want of a better term, a factor. So they're just different terms. This is where you need to have some document that you can work through yourself to say, well, it's not as confusing as it seems once you go through it. You can, um, and one of the, the keys for this is matching terms. Um, so when you see a mercantile agent or a factor, basically the same thing. So what is a mercantile agent? It's someone who carries on business of selling goods on behalf of others. Have a look at the Factors Act, have a look at section two that says a mercantile agent means a mercantile agent, don't you love definitions with, that use the same terminology? Anyway, a mercantile agent means a mercantile agent having in the customary course of business such um, an agent as authority to sell goods or consign goods or to buy good, goods or raise money on the security of those goods. And mercantile agents have possession as bailee and they may sell the goods on behalf of the owner for a fee. So there are some critical elements that go with that. So the person who is the mercantile agent or the factor is invested with an apparent authority to sell the goods by the owner to the public. So the buyer is dealing with the factor in the ordinary course of the business. So the mere reliance by a buyer in this situation does not absolve the buyer from the implications of the Nemo Dat rule. In that regard, have a look at section three of the Factors Act and it provides that where a mercantile agent is in possession of goods, of course, with the consent of the owner, 
then the agent, when undertaking the ordinary course of business, um, sells the goods, that will be valid as if the agent were expressly authorised to deal with him in that way. And subsection two of section three talks about where the um, uh, mercantile agent has been in possession of the goods, then the disposition would be valid if consent had continued, notwithstanding the determination of the consent. So there's an example of where the actions of an owner may not be sufficient to overcome the presumption that the mercantile agent had the appropriate authority to sell the goods. And what we're really do, talking about here is that inherent conflict between the interests of two parties that both on the face of it have a good claim to ownership of the goods and the mercantile um, provisions of the Factors Act go towards resolving that issue. Now there is a case called the Astley Industrial Trust against Miller. It's 1968 to All England 36. And you'll see that this is quoted in your textbook at 470. And in that case, Justice Chapman said in discussing the application of the factors legislation, the statutory power under the legislation to pass title, which is vested in a mercantile agent, depends on his having possession of, um, in, in his capacity as mercantile agent, and the true owner having consented to him having possession in that capacity. If that's occurred, then title can pass. Well, we've built, dealt with some pretty tough process this week. Um, I'm going to ask you to read your material carefully, proactively, try to make some sense of it for yourself. But at least if you're really struggling, make some notes about some basic principles. A good starting point is definitions. Under each of the definitions um, where there's relevant case law or legislation, make reference to that and try to develop a little flow chart for yourself as one option or another option is try to develop some blurb where looking at it from an Iraq perspective, you're, you're trying to identify what the rules are in some way that you can then reproduce in a, uh, an answer to a problem based around these issues. All right, I've mentioned um, today some statutes and just a reminder about some of the basic statutory interpretation principles. And this is just to wrap up today's session. So when you're looking at statutory interpretation, of course, there's the literal approach, which is based on the engineer's case and words in legislation according to the literal approach must be interpreted in a way that um, conforms with their plain and ordinary meaning. So in that strict sense, the plain and ordinary meaning must be adopted even if it results in that which is inconvenient or improbable and the authority for that, the engineer's case, 1920, 28 CLR 129. However, the modern approach, which is reflected in Project Blue Sky against Australian Broadcasting Authority, 1998-194-CLR-355, is that whilst the literal approach was once dominant, the literal meaning now must yield to the purpose of the statute and the context and the canons of construction or the presumptions of interpretation. So generally, we don't simply read the words of a section of an act and apply them without looking at the words of surrounding sections and indeed the act as a whole. And the authority for that proposition is KNS Lake City Freighters, Proprietary Limited against Gordon and Gotch Limited, 1985 218 CLR 216. So it means that you need to consider the act as a whole before you zero in and state that this must be the case about a particular provision because it may be coloured or influenced by its per the purpose or context of the legislation. Um, just remember, of course, the distinction between may and shall, which do um, sometimes uh, 
cause some concern, have a look at the Commonwealth Interpretation Act, at um, the Acts Interpretation Act, I mean, at section 33, and have a look at section 32CA of the Queensland Act. All right, um, remember, of course, that what's important is the intention of Parliament, so that may mean that you need to consider the explanatory note or explanatory memorandum. And remember, of course, that all words in a statute have meaning. Project Blue Sky is again authority for that. And the statement of Justice Brennan, Chief Justice Brennan, at the time, a court construing a statutory provision must strive to give every, uh, every word meaning in that provision. All right, thank you very much for uh, today's session. Good luck during this week, and we'll see you soon. All the best. Bye.